多位嘉宾。Yeah, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. So today I'm very happy to be here to share with you my topic about the my experience uh, with uh, super high rises. Uh, I think uh, I would like to share with you my observations uh, from the perspective of the developers uh, or the owners. And also during the process of construction, so what are the difficulties and highlights? Well, today my topic is uh, the study of difficulties of uh, super high rises, complex and control points due to, to time limit. So I would like to share with you some of the management uh, philosophies. Well, in the 21st uh, century, so China is uh, already become a dominant. Um, market uh, for the super high rises. Uh, you can find that a lot of uh, famous uh, high rises uh, are located in China now. So today my topic will be divided into four parts. So first, uh, I will give you very brief uh, introduction about our um, super tall complex projects uh, in our company. So actually, this is already an old uh, slide. Uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, so for the number of uh, super tall um, high rises projects, is already more than 14 um, projects. Uh, so you can find that. So they are some of our projects. Uh, for example, um, Zifeng in and uh, also 66 in Wuhan city. So here. This is uh, our first super tall building. I'm also very honored that uh, as uh, the technical director, I was engaged uh, in this uh, project uh, for the whole process. At the end of 2010, it is already put in use and it is in operation very well. So this is uh, the super tall um, building and to be um, finished uh, very soon. So you can see that uh, this is the real picture. So it has already completed uh, at the top and uh, by the end of uh, this year and uh, the um, building, especially its hotel, will also be put into use. So second, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, its um, um, business mode. So I have uh, made the classification like this. Uh, the first generation, second generation doesn't mean yeah, it is actually more advanced. Uh, so let's uh, just uh, take a look at uh, the evolution of uh, the business mode. Uh, first uh, generation, it is mainly focused on the office coupled with the food and uh, beverage uh, or tourism. So you can see that uh, these uh, are very famous existing um, buildings for the first generation, mainly based uh, on office. But for the second generation projects, it should be based on office, also hotel, and including something else. I think for Qingmao Tower, I think it is uh, one of the earliest uh, projects uh, based on both office and uh, hotel, and also for our Greenland uh, group. And for our first uh, two super tall buildings, uh, I'll try to uh, make a copy or imitate uh, this um, business mode. And also, let's uh, take a look at Guanta in um, Guangzhou, and also IFC in Hong Kong, and also Shanghai and Tower. So they are also the um, benchmarks of the second generation business mode. Well, for the third generation, it will be even larger and uh, with uh, more diversified functions in addition to office and hotel. And in addition, there will also be apartments uh, inside the super tall buildings, uh, like um, 606 in Wuhan city, uh, which is belonging to this uh, third generation. Well, from this perspective, so this is also a huge um, challenge for us because for such a projects, yeah, it is uh, still not a very mature business mode in China. There are some um, projects uh, in overseas markets, uh, but because of the economic reason and also financial reason, so we are still trying to explore this business mode for this uh, third generation project. Uh, well, there are some shortcomings. For example, the property management fee will be very high, and uh, the actual area will be relatively small. And uh, actually, unlike the regular apartment, uh, you mm, the use habit will also be different. In the third generation B, you know, there are limited number of office functionalities. As we know, in the Khalifa Tower, there are still a certain amount of uh, office needs. 
But later on, they just want to increase the total height of the structure, so they are going to have to add some additional space. When it comes to China, the third generation B type of projects are very limited in number, and all the three reference projects are from overseas jurisdictions. Now we also have the third generation C, the projects mainly based on apartment plus retails. You can look at some of the towers in the States in some uh, products that are commonly found in India. The next, I'll give you a very brief analysis of the characteristics and the difficulties of super tall complexes. First, let's uh, look at the characteristics. Of course, we're going to have to combine those characteristics with the local conditions on the ground in China. First, large capital investments. In the latter stage, operational cost is very high. The entire payback kind of uh, period is very long. And as of today, you know, we have like the sales and you know, leasing going on simultaneously. Some of the products are sold, and the remaining part is held to be let. You look at Jimao Tower. In uh, some uh, of the projects developed by Greenland Group ourselves, the annual energy cost is worth like more than 10 million. So the energy kind of consumption level is really very high. It has a high requirement for capital investment. Second, the long construction cycle, and uh, it is dependent or determined by the external economic environment and a policy environment. And in China, normally speaking, it takes like more than five to six years to completely finish the construction. And you have to look at the technical dimension in the review and examination or approval kind of procedures, et cetera. It takes a long time. And when we were trying to build the Zifeng Tower in Nanjing, I still remembered some of the details. And uh, we try to apply for the kind of uh, application with the government in terms of our ability or capabilities to prove the earthquake. And uh, then, fortunately, our project uh, got the green light uh, quicker than some of our competing products. The third characteristic is the numerous project-related companies that create comprehensive integrations and the management difficulties. So it's really very hard to do consolidation across the board. And as super tall complex buildings, and it also has its own attractive uh, features because of the difficulties. People just want to challenge the difficulties. And a fourth feature is the great difficulties in design and construction, and a lot of technical difficulties, and also some specialized uh, approval schemes. In China, for the height above 300 meters, you're going to have to apply with like the national government authorities level in terms of the earthquake proof capabilities in a fire fighting capabilities. In the meantime, also the pumping of the concrete to a very high height. And then how can you do dismantle of those different equipment on such a big altitude? And a fifth characteristic is the huge political influences. It is under the public scrutiny, because normally speaking, for those super high rises, it captures a lot of attention from each one of the stakeholders or resident, uh, citizens in the city. The government, as well as the industrial peers, will pay a lot of attention to the development progress of the towers. Taking Sifeng Tower as an example, the construction cycle was uh, six years, and uh, several official, several dozen official visits were arranged. Some uh, vice mayor level or above level kind of uh, officials paid a visit to the construction site during the entire construction cycle. Sixth. We have a lack of a human resources with a narrow selection of design and construction companies with related experiences in similar projects. How can I put it? And currently, it is very popular for Chinese companies to do planning and construction or development of the super tall buildings. And people may feel it is not that really not that difficult to build such buildings. However, a lot of our projects are still on the stage of planning and design. So many of them are still en route to be finished lay construction. We still have a severe lack of those human resources in the specialized uh, firms in the designing institutes that have a strong track record in the past. How can we recruit the people we want? This is also another challenge. Seventhly, we have great difficulties in operation and management in the future. 
uh, currently, when it comes to those uh, complex, it is pretty much mixed-use uh, kind of a property compound. And due to the functional complexities, you know, then the property management process is very intricate. For example, hotel use uh, the special hotel management operator, and their apartment or office buildings also have their own property management partners. And the retail also has a special retail management operator. So how can we do division of responsibilities among all those different stakeholders? This may be a difficult point. And then when it comes to the IT room, it is impossible for you to create uh, several different IT rooms for each use of this property. You have to put them in a centralized IT room. And then how can you do coordination? This will be very complicated. The next, from the perspective of the property owner, I would like to share with you further some of our thinking or perspectives about management. Of course, some of my views are really superficial because I have very limited time for my talk today. In a first, the control pattern selection, two types available currently. First, outsourcing based. You know, you may choose a lot of a consultants in the quality kind of a architectural firm. And in Hong Kong and overseas, the outsourcing based pattern is more popular. The benefit of this pattern is if you put together a very experienced team with those professionals and specialists, then the quality of the architectural product will be guaranteed. The downside of this pattern first lies with cost. It's very difficult to control cost. Second, it may be led or predominated by architects. Second, type is the insourcing based. So the property owner has to play a role that leans toward like technology uh, contractorship. And it is very difficult to carry out overall administration or management. And uh, what about the cost level, the quality level? You're going to have to depend on the horizons, experience, and the growth capabilities of the managerial team. It's necessary to put together a learning-oriented team that has already got some past experiences, but they need to learn along the way. And uh, it's difficult to do that. But this kind of a team that is learning-oriented is very important. And project pre-positioning. And we have a saying in China to the effect that a good start will bring you already halfway success to the journey. However, we may even have to consider a lot of uh, difficult, uh, complicated factors, for example, political factors. The government may stake a lot of hope on your project, trying to develop your project into an iconic landmark in a city. But from our technical professional perspective, we still have to consider operations effectively. Therefore, the valid and effective project pre-positioning is vital to the life cycle success of your project. Normally speaking, you do not have a lot of uh, reference examples which you can borrow experience from. And but we think it's necessary and important to learn some lessons and accumulate some experiences based on some of the other projects that are out there already. And uh, please make sure you set the low hanging fruit. Please do not have a uh, too much aspiration. And uh, your ideals are great, but in the latter stage, you find you cannot uh, reach those ideals and the expectations that you may make some change at a hoc. This is not good. And we would like to have different uh, categories of those super top buildings. For example, first type of the buildings has very high cost, and uh, they depends a lot on architects. Second type, just like my group, for example, Green Lane to group, and we look more attention to aesthetics and economicality of the building. We also attach great deal of importance to the latter stage operations. And a third, the economical projects or products, especially with those unmature developers, they only blindly pursue the height. They do not really care too much about quality. And I think that at the height level, above 200 meters and below 300 meters, yeah, we have a lot of these kind of uh, categories of uh, projects. And then the early stage coordination among different parameters and uh, indicators. As we know, that as we try to develop the super top building complex, 
And as we mentioned already, the government and the general public staked a lot of a hope or anticipation on your project. That makes your project more complicated. According to our analysis, currently we have around 20 super tall buildings with a height of over 300 meters in our pipeline. But 90 percent of the ongoing projects have some poor management in terms of the index or indicator negotiation. So we need to coordinate with the government better on this regard. For example, in terms of the plot ratio, coverage rates, parking indicators, structural gauge, power transmission loads, vehicle entrance, and basement setbacks, etc., especially when it comes to parking indicator or index, super tall building parking index directly borrow the kind of uh, numbers from those regular buildings. But if the plot rate is too high, maybe sometimes the basement has to go down, for example, to level 9 or level 10 even on the ground. And uh, this is not really realistic in the actual design in reality. So on the early stage of inauguration of the project, when it comes to our practice, we will do very careful calculation on those indexes, and we communicated our ideas to the government earlier on very effectively. It is not necessary to say that the less parking sites or lots you have, the better it will be. But we have to be able to meet the current realistic needs for the parking space. And then you also give certain scalability to it. For example, in five years, maybe you can scale it up to a higher level of a parking space. Next, major design companies in a proposal selections. 80% of the project costs are almost completely decided at the beginning of the early expansion stage of the design work. To a certain extent or a large extent, the costs and the qualities are determined by the selection of the design company and a design proposal. You look at the Sifong Tower, and that was one of our early projects in this field, and we were not that experienced. So we selected the SOM and also its East China Research Institute as the main design unit. And this helped us a lot. So I think in architectural field, if conditions allow, make sure you can put together a wonderful, experienced design team. Yeah, if the property owner has a stronger managerial capabilities with a experienced design team, then you can loosen your requirement for selection of those design units or institutes. But at least you're going to make sure uh, they are subjected or they're after great aspirations and expectations. And then design management. I would like to say the design process management is a procedure that involves continuous choices and decisions. And the owner should respect the design company's judgments rather than having suspicions of their design teams. As aesthetically speaking, we hope that both elites and the general public will take the fancy to the design. And some general public, of course, pay more attention to economicality of the project as well as the safety and the actual practicality of different ideas. So we need to respect design, but please do not actually downplay the role played by design. So we need to take the mediocre attitudes toward design. Do not go to the two extremes. In a property, architects should have a basket of different uh, perspectives taken into consideration uh, in doing management. You need to look at different uh, points of view. And uh, you, you're just like an integrator. For example, so what role an integrator should play? And as we know that no matter whether you are a constructor or a designer, you maybe appear in a picture on a certain stage across the entire process. However, when it comes to property owner, we have to engage in the entire process from the beginning to the end. So as a quality property owner team, you have to be integrator, integrating all those different related resources and do consolidation. And a second, it is just like a translator. What we need to do is to translate the kind of appeals or the requests uh, from the client to the architects. And we need to tell them what are the objectives and a third decision maker.
So each step along the way, we're going to have to make different decisions. Sometimes the architects may told, uh, tell us that now we have uh, three directions or five directions. So what will be your call? And uh, finally, we are implementer. And uh, throughout the entire process, yet we need to make sure that the decisions can be pulled around our design direction and make a headway, and, or maybe we even need to consider compliance to the government requirement and expectation. And the property technical manager is just like a movie producer and a director, because if you want to produce a very good film or movie, you're going to have to act in stars as well as uh, wonderful directors and the producers. And uh, we also have a lot of uh, special uh, tasks or specialized design tasks. And uh, in our project, we may invite uh, some uh, experienced consultants or we invite those constructing units to do technical coordination and cooperation. So in the interest of a time, I will not go into much detail on each bullet point. And uh, then effectiveness of communications. We worked a lot with our overseas collaborators and uh, partners. And uh, we have different cultural backgrounds, different uh, conceptions, and different ways of doing expression of the views. And uh, the Chinese way is not supposed to be adopted. You know, because you're, you're going to have to talk to, with our overseas partners in a straightforward pattern. And then our project progress can be made efficiently. The integration of various professions is no easy job. And if you are working on interior design, you may not be very familiar with uh, the MEP part. And uh, the mechanical and electrical engineers are not very familiar with some other faculties. So as property owner, you're going to have to integrate our objectives and uh, c make sure that your messages can come across with all those different uh, stakeholders. When the construction is completed, then the project as a whole is 90% through. But when it comes to super tall buildings, it is more complicated than that. If the construction join is completed and uh, you still have uh, remaining 50% of the work to do, and uh, for example, what about the uh, design or the bidding? For example, the tendering on MEP equipment and the architect cannot appoint or designate some brand, but with the parameters on table and in the actual tendering process, there may be deviation between the proposed plans with the original expectations. So how can we do coordination, make sure it can meet our design requirement as well as functional needs? And this is where we can do a lot of work. And we do not only look at the lowest cost to decide on the winner, but we want to strike a balance between cost and quality. And in terms of the kind of a bidding management pattern, I would like to share with you our pattern. Taking Sifeng Tower as an example, the number of the total contracts is 300, and also several dozen contracts with a total value more than 10 million. You look at the general contractorship or the steel structure or elevators, some of the contract value even go beyond the level of 100 million RMB. Therefore, in the process of the bidding and the tendering, we need to engage in technical discussions with those corresponding uh, stakeholders or participants and uh, look at their reactions, make sure that our technical requirements can all be met with no blind spot. And uh, we have a huge number of construction management uh, constructors in the several dozen or even more than a hundred constructing participants. And the property owner cannot uh, replace the general contractor. You're going to have to do supervision and monitoring on the general contractor and all those different constructing participants from the macro level and give them great support. The scheduling control is one of the vital factors that may affect your deadline requirement. And sometimes the constructors think, think if the deadline is not realistic, then they have no stress. So what we want to set up in terms of the scheduling level is the low-hanging fruit. With a little bit input, they are going to reach it. And also quality control, as we know, that sometimes we need to adopt very important means to control quality and also identify those potential design problems and also make sure that we can actually 
identify those early loopholes and address those problems so to make sure about the smooth operations later on. And the, uh, the external coordination is also very important. Uh, in China, it should be done by the owner. And then also, we require the internal coordination. Yeah, because uh, during the peak and time of construction, there will be thousands of uh, the people engaged and dozens of the companies involved. There will be some conflicts and overlap. So the coordination internally and externally are also very important. So finally, yeah, with the rapid growth of China's economy and the super tall um, buildings have already been entered into the new area. So there are a lot of um, drivers uh, to um, make a project successful. So it is related to the quality of the design and construction and also the infrastructure and also the maturity of uh, the industries. I believe that uh, the new area has given us uh, more opportunities and uh, platforms. But at the same time, we should also bear more social responsibilities uh, and uh, obligations. Uh, it is uh, believed that yeah, we will continue to join hands with all the stakeholders uh, for more successes. Thank you for your listening.